Välkommen till Global Access. Jag heter Thomas Skyr och idag ska jag tala med Mariano Sigman. Han är doktor i neurovetenskap och vi ska prata om det mänskliga medvetandet och vad vi vet om det. Kunskap och information, det är temat för årets upplaga av Global Access. Kunskapens betydelse har varit uppenbar för människan sedan Adam och Evas tid. Men informationssamhället ställer oss inför nya frågor. Vad innebär det allt intensivare flödet av information och åsikter med vår förmåga till helhetssyn och förståelse? Gör det oss klokare eller dummare? Mariano Sigman är en argentinsk neurospecialist, framförallt inriktad på studier om hur hjärnan och vårt medvetande agerar när det fattar beslut. Kan man säga att självmedvetenheten och förmågan till introspektion uppstod vid ett visst tillfälle i människans utveckling? Mariano Sigman berättar mer för Thomas Gyr. When we study the brain as we are able to do now with fairly advanced technology, what What do we see? What do we see in when people are asleep, when they play chess? What do we see in children's brains? Do we do we see any specific patterns that are unique? Well, we we see patterns of brain activation, uh, but this turns out to be a very complex signal. It's not it's not actually as pretty as we see it in the newspapers, where you see you know a certain state of thought and then one or two very well defined blobs that gives the feeling that. The activation of these specific blobs is what conveys this specific pattern of thoughts, a dream, an imagination, movement, memory, emotion, and so on. And but so the truth is that despite I'd say an immense effort of in the community of neuroscience and, and very vast and productive work, we still do not know what the neural code for thoughts is. So to put it in this way, if you would want to know for any given pattern of thought, the memory of something or the experience of an emotion or making a right or wrong decision, what will be exactly the specific pattern of brain activation that will correspond with this pattern of thought is something that still remains largely unknown. So I'd like to give an analogy uh, for genetics. Today we have a very good idea of what the essence of the code is. We know that there are like four letters, four different molecules that actually build words that are like the genes, and then the genes make sentences, which are genes of genes. In neuroscience, we've, we've learned a lot. We, we know that the brain is made of neurons, that neurons uh, have this thing called action potentials, where they produce a very intense and rapid signal. And in the specific pattern in time of this uh, action potential spikes, uh, as they're simply called. And, and how they interact with other neurons, and there's some information. We also know things like, broadly, there are brain regions that are more relevant for specific uh, uh, mental uh, elements. Like, for instance, the frontal cortex, which is something that, that's it's widely developed in humans, is important for what we call cognitive control. So like when you want to do something badly, but you know you shouldn't do it, so you can hold your actions, because you know that in the future this will be wrong. We know that there is a specific region of the brain that's very necessary for this specific computation. We know that there is a part of the brain down here that's called the visual cortex that we know that actually encodes a visual information in the brain. And we have a vague idea of how it does so. So it's a bit like a, like a digital camera that it has a, a mapping of space into different portion, portions of the cortical mantle. But so, so I'd say that the state of the field is a mixture in which we've learned by by hard work uh, enough that we can begin decoding mental states from brain activity so it's good enough that we can do that but it's not good enough that we can do that in a in a principled way or in a theoretical way sometimes it is said that the brain the human brain is the most complicated structure we know in the universe today uh, and it's our brains from a philosophical point of view Are we able? Will we be able to understand our own functioning, the, our, our, our own brain functioning yeah. with our own brains, yeah. Yeah. or do we have to be outside it in a way, or, yeah. or more superior intelligence? Yes, yes. This is a very good and difficult question. I, th I think that, uh, and I think it's a question more for philosophy today than it is for science. I mean, science. We scientists can speculate about that. I, I, I'd say two things. The first one is that 
Systematically, humans have been anthropocentric in on all domains. I mean, we, we thought that we were in the center of the universe, and, and now we know we are not. And I think a bit that the brain being the most complex structure in the universe is as still we, a, as far as we know. <laughs> yes, but I mean, I mean, you could take just a stone, mm. and somehow you know you could you know grain it down into pieces, and, and it gets as at least it's, I think I think that we're comparing infinites mm. in complexity, and and so I, I, th I think that in a way complexity is relative to the kind of questions that we want to ask to a system. Um, so th that's one thing, but but of course it's it's. I mean, it doesn't need to be the more complicated one to understand that it's it's incredibly vast. And and again, like the Society of, for Neuroscience, which is held in the United States every year, holds about forty thousand students. Sorry, forty thousand scientists, the majority of which are students. And when I go there, I always think, you know, it's you see like thirty thousand posters. Each poster is the life, day and night. Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, even weekends, because students work like crazy for years and years and years. So you can walk there and you have the aggregated knowledge of easily, easily 200,000 hours of very intense human work. Mm. Uh, and then you'd say, well, I mean, it's a lot of effort. What have we learned? And then it comes back to the question we were, we were, we were discussing before. We've learned a lot, but, but the feeling is still that there is much more to learn there's much more unknown than, than what we have actually learned. And so for the question of can the brain understand the brain, which is a philosophical, of course there are all these uh, paradoxes in mathematics, like the Gödel theorem yes. and so on, where... The where, Russell where, paradox and so forth. Yeah. Russell, mm. where, where you know that logical systems fail when they try to inquire about themselves. Mm. So you need another mathematics to actually probe the, the rationality or, or the veracity or, of, 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 of a certain given formal system. One can think about this argument. It's, it's, not, it's not directly applied to the brain, because, but, but one could think whether this structure is actually conceived to understand itself. And there is even an evolutionary argument mm. that maybe it would be desirable not to understand ourselves. So some, some neuroscientists have this provocative view that maybe there is a reason why actually the brain would not want to understand itself. Uh, and if, if we should sum up in a way of for the last 10, 20 years that brain research has developed so much. And what have we specifically learned that we didn't know before, which is of, 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 of um, uh, something totally uh, of, of new or path-breaking? Yes, it's, it's a hard question, of course, because, uh, because there's a lot of research and, and obviously I'm a bit biased what toward, toward these things. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, think, I think that, that would be, I would feel yeah. more comfortable saying what to me have been yeah. more striking things. We now have tools, which you referred to in the very beginning, that allow us to see the brain, which we could metaphorically think, metaphorically think as, as the factory of thought, so to say. And so we could try to read thoughts directly where they're being produced. It's done on a very rudimentary way still, so it's not like you can, from your own uh, wheel of thought, you know, direct a machine that will read all your intentions and desires and sentences and will speak for you. But it's a bit like, you know, the, the old uh, writing machine and now we have computers. This is, once the concept is there, we can develop it into, then it's yeah. just an issue of technology. So what, but what type of, we can, I guess we can see some basic emotions. If they are sorry, if they are sad, if they are happy, can we see more complex emotions also? It's, yeah, or complex patterns of thought. Yeah, so for, yeah, I think I think that one of the most pro promising venues. There, there are two domains where we've been quite successful in in decoding uh, mental states from brain activity. One is the domain of vision, because as I said, the 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 brain mantle in which we represent images is organized in a very reasonable way, almost like a camera, where you mm. have a mantle, and this mantle, if it's active here, this means that there's light here, and if, if it's active here, so you can try to, from the activity in the brain, draw the image, again, in low resolution. So with these people that are doing now things like this, I, I'm, I'm watching a film, and you're watching my brain, and from the image in my brain, you can reconstruct the film that I'm watching. So from, from the pattern of brain activity, you can actually reconstruct my own experience. You can do more than that. You can reconstruct things that to me were unconscious. So things that I did not, there's more in my brain that I can access. This was the huge idea of Freud. I mean, the mm, idea and that- I'm aware of for, uh, 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 consciously. Yeah, on yeah. a sense, let's say, in a sense that I could describe it to you. Yes. I mean, there's a lot of information that my brain is processing that we know that affects behavior, 
as Freud identified, but that if you would ask me, did you see that? I would say no, there's no way that I can report this. We think because it's not conscious, there is a discussion, maybe I was conscious, but I lost it in memory. Mm -hmm. But in any case, it's not useful for explicit reports. We can hold to this definition of consciousness for now. So um, this is one venue, it's actually the coding images. Another one would be decoding the action verbs, so mm -hmm. things, because when you think of an action verb, like, like throwing a ball or eating, so those are verbs that are referred to movement, those verbs connect to body parts. So you, like when you throw a ball, you, you, you imagine that you're actually moving your leg or your hand. When you're speaking, you're moving your voice. When you're dancing, you're moving all your body. And again, because in the brain, the body parts are more or less easily spread on a way that we can decode it, mm -hmm. we can infer that. But here's the interesting thing. Imagine you could only decode two things. Like I'm thinking about light in the left and light in the right. Imagine that's all you can do, and it doesn't look like it's enough, but it's a lot, because once you've had that, you can have a communication device yeah, where yeah, I can... A binary communication. It's a binary communication, yeah, yeah. but it's, it's, it's Morse code, but it's good mm -hmm. enough. So yeah, it, imagine, imagine you're locked in, and I tell you, you know what, when you want to say yes, mm -hmm. imagine light in the left. Mm -hmm. And when you want to say no, imagine light in the, in, in, yes. in, in the right. Mm -hmm. This is very simple, but this allows me to ask you questions yes. which before I could not ask. Mm -hmm. So here's generally the, the way... If, if you, if you, coming back to the beginning of the question, what has, a, what's my favorite, not just a particular result, but the, but the general project of how I see neuroscience as a fertile human activity, is it's made thought more transparent. Human thought is usually opaque. It's very hard to understand what other persons are feeling. It's very hard to understand what we are feeling. It's very hard to understand what our children are feeling. And actually, we struggle for that. Mm. They cry because they're hungry. They cry because they, 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 they want to eat. They, they cry because they, 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 they have pain parent, somewhere. I guess you do understand some of what type of crying patterns there are. This is a hungry cry. This is a... Of course, we've learned. Yeah. I mean, we've been yeah. around. In, I'm, but, and your question actually brings me... I mean, I, I mentioned this, but I should mention it again. I'm not saying that human communication begins with neuroscience. Human communication begins with a, with a species that actually very highly tuned for the communication and intention. All I'm saying is, in the same way, that curiosity for you know, the universe where we belong has been with us forever, but telescope changed the capacity that we can do that. I'm saying the capacity of actually getting into the minds of the other people yes. through technology. Mm. Mm. I mean, there were observatories before the telescope was of invented, course, we, but, but, but they were much more advanced with the correct instruments. I yes. guess that's where we are going with the brain research as well. Yes, and, 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 and questions that pertain completely to philosophy begin being questions about science with the mm. change of technology. And now we can all also try to define what is human consciousness in a, from a scientific way, or? Yes, um, but... but when you come to, you can, you can define, I think that, so people will have different views. My, views. my view on this is the definition of human consciousness, it's, it's not purely scientific. I think, and, and I think it's true also for the majority of, uh, I think it's the same for like, if you, you could think of the definition of democracy. Mm. I mean, we can, we, can, we can agree on what a democracy is, we can agree on what, so, I, because I can ask you questions, like is a dog conscious or not? Is a, is a mouse conscious or not? Mm. Is a baby conscious or not? And I think that to answer these questions, we need to agree before. I mean, science can answer this question if we agree on what we accept yes. are the right measures of consciousness. In the same way that if I ask you, is this society a, a democracy mm. or not? Right. I mean, we but may I'm, have a discussion. But I guess we, could, uh, about uh, <clears throat> if we should agree uh, on self-awareness as, 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 as an important part of consciousness, of, of an identity of, its, of, of yourself. Yes, some people will, will argue that, no, mm. that there's a form of consciousness in which you are actually uh, just uh, being, uh, uh, you, you're aware of your environment. Like this is the, 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 a more primitive form of consciousness. You could think it, you're, you're watching a movie and you're aware of this movie, mm. but you don't feel you're a particularly relevant agent with, with, within this movie. And interestingly, this seems a very a, a typical for how we think of consciousness, but the first thing is, is this is the consciousness of our dreams in yes. the most part. So when, we, when we're dreaming, we are conscious, we, we can tell our dreams, we can access the content of our dreams, but it's not a volitional conscious, consciousness. Many, it, it varies, it depends on, on the dream and on the, on the dreamers, but, but many 
often dreams are have a consciousness which is different from the waking consciousness, not in the in the quality of the representation of consciousness, but in the agency, mm-hmm. in the sense that we feel we are being part of an experience without actually being the players of this experience. And interestingly, uh, some people, and this this goes goes back to, to my own work, and, and, and we, we, we could discuss about that, is we have some data, and some people have proposed before, that actually maybe humans have had this form of consciousness, a consciousness which we say is not volitional, a consciousness in which you don't recognize yourself as the agent, as the major actor within the film of reality in which we are. And, and, and there is a proposal that we, in which, if you want, we, we could dwell in, that humans actually, I mean, even you know, recent ancestors, only 3,000 or 4,000 years ago, had a very different form of consciousness. Yeah, because when you look at older texts, which I, get, I know that you have done, and if you read older texts, and, and, and also still in, in, in some, many other cultures, that dreams are actually true, in a sense that uh, people actually speak about their dreams as, as a part of something that has happened uh, in a way outside the world, but in a real fashion. Yeah, so there, there are two parts to this. One, one is the idea of dreams as oracles. So the idea that dreams are, are they have this adivinatory uh, 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 aspect. And, and for this, there's a rationality in the sense that dreams are not just, Francis Crick, the Nobel Prize, uh, in, in the last years of his research and of his life, he dwelled into neuroscience and consciousness. And he had this idea of dreams, which I myself think it's wrong, which is that dreams were in a way like just random it was a moment of, of complete randomness in, in brain activation. But this seems quite unlikely. First, because we all know that we repeat dreams right. often, and yeah. the likelihood of this would be extremely mm. low. And second, and th- there comes the idea of the oracles. Dreams seem to be a closer idea of dreams, is that they're, they're closer to play, in the sense that they're simulations mm. in which we alter things. We can ask questions like, they're a bit like science. Yeah. What if? Mm. How would I feel if you know, she would say yes to me? Yes. I mean, in, in life I cannot yeah. experience that, but in dreams I, I can experience that and I can understand my feelings and simulate my feelings in the future. So this is a reason why dreams actually uh, have a reason to have been perceived throughout history as, as oracles. It's, it's that actually that's part of, of what they are there for, maybe, which is actually uh, simulating a, a probabilistic future. Mm. That doesn't mean dreams are always right, no, of no. course, because there are simulations and they're, they're, they're educated guesses about the future, if, if, you, if you wish. And, and sometimes, I guess, they are not also simulations based on normative wishful thinking that, that we would like to see things exactly. happen. Exactly. They're, yes. also, they're also you know, <clears throat> biased yes. by, by our own desires and emotions. So, so there is a Chris Fried. He's a, he's a, a neuroscience, neuroscientist, cognitive neuroscientist in, in, in UCL in London, which I admire very deeply. He had this very interesting idea about schizophrenia, which I think the first time people listen to, to this uh, sounds a bit awkward, but then I think it's, it's quite reasonable. I think if you ask people how, like their intuitions on what it is to be a schizophrenic, is it's someone that's plagued of, of hallucinations and, and you know, weird mental content. This is how we picture you know, a, a schizophrenics. It, it, it's like we do not make these creations. By we, I mean people not non-schizophrenics, and schizophrenics will make all these weird mental creations. Chris Fried had this idea that, to put it simple, is quite different, saying that we all make these weird mental creations. The only difference is that the people that are not schizophrenic know that they're creating this, this, this mental activity. And in knowing that, they know that this weirdness is not something that's coming you know, from the sky or from the gods or from the muses or from the dreams. It's normal mental activity. Like, you just close the doors of any person that goes in an elevator will start producing thoughts. Mm. Oh, I wish you know, this would have happened, this goal would have been scored, or, or I would have done this work which I didn't do. And, and we're you know, compulsively a, a making a, a, a very active factory of thought. But we know we are the owners of, of these thoughts. And, and again, this seems, this is the kind, in, in neuroscience, there are all these interesting domains of trying to understand how we do these things that seem completely obvious, 
But when you think about them, it's incredibly hard to know how do we do them. How, how, how on earth do I know that these voices that are on my head belong to me? Mm. This is something I need, I need to learn. Children, we think, do not know that. This is why you know, they have imaginary friends. Yeah. They but, hear, bo- yeah. But, but, but then <laughs> when you go back, as I know that you've done, to look on all the texts uh, and, and go through them uh, in, in massively, then you can... S- I guess you can see patterns of that kind. That it's and, and it's fairly obvious also when you read uh, uh, ancient authors and, uh, and legends and so so much that 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 people were in much more uh, tuned into the voices that they heard. Uh, to, the, the angels talking to them, prophecies, demon uh, demons coming visiting them, yes. uh, and 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 they didn't quite differ between, and they were not quite obviously not quite aware that they were producing these thoughts themselves. Were they schizophrenics? Well, so so this is Julian Jaynes. I mean, one of the most yeah. controversial uh, psychologists in the 20th century, and and, and a, again a, a hero of mine. He's Julian Jaynes said too many things, probably many of them were wrong, but he had the merit, I think, of, of trying to think theoretically about a field that doesn't have too much theory, like we were saying before, neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience. And his idea, which it's summarized in a single sentence, he, he thought that, you know, before the axial age, so before like 3,000 years ago, not too long, I mean, this is nothing in the history of it, I mean, it's just, you know, the yesterday, night, yeah. yesterday in the history of humanity, or, or you know, last hour. Uh, the world was a garden of schizophrenics. This, the, that, that this was a very different mental landscape. And that again, that consciousness, the way we know it today, and which seems obvious, where we are the pilots of our own existence, where, you know, we, we've, and, and this gives us responsibility, this gives us guilt, this gives us the notion of free will. I mean, all these things, James claims, are a very recent cultural invention. So, so in and a way, I, our, our understanding of what is to be a human from a consciousness point of view is not something that is det- it's determined by biology, but it's produced by culture. Is that what exactly? It, yeah. and, and but this is the, and it's fairly new. Yeah. Well, this is this is. And we'll go back again to Jane's claim. But yes, this this is exactly the point. And but this is true for many human virtues. Mm-hmm. So if you if you ask the yes, question of, of mm-hmm. what what are the what are the essential components of human thought, if there are any of them. And then how can you answer this question? You can go to different cultures and try to think which things are expressed. So maybe we all have a sense of mathematics. Maybe a very rudimentary form of mathematics is something that's actually almost like we all you know, have a, a body with a certain respiration and with a certain you know, immune system and so on. Maybe your cognition has features that vary across people that, but have you know, an, a, a very conserved architecture. So, this has been a very difficult question. For instance, is language a human universal? We think it, it, it looks like because we all produce language, but we know it's not. We know that if, if you get a person and you grow this person not in the right social context, then they will not produce yes. language. Casper House is a Casper wolf, wolf child. Wolf yes, child. Yes, exactly, children, exactly. Yes. Those, these, these stories do have problems because, because they are a bit... Uh, they mix fiction with, mm. with uh, reality. But... but but it, the, the best guess that we can make is that, and, and we know that humans at a certain point in history did not have a language, or, or we think mm. that at least. And, and so you could ask imagination. I mean, have there ever been in, on earth humans that did not have the capacity to imagine, or to dream, or to remember? So like I would say memory is an essential element of human uh, cognition, but I do not have the data for that. And I would have said consciousness is also very, you know, fundamental and universal human virtue. What we, what James suggested and what we've discovered and what we somehow showed uh, down the path of James is that that may not be the case. And going back to, to the examples you were giving, there's one I like particularly, like if you take the relation between Hector, uh, Hector and, and Apollo. Mm. Uh, Apollo is a god that appears to Hector. And, Hector, when he goes to war, he doesn't want to go to war because he thinks he has to go to war or because he feels he wants to go to war or because he goes to war because Apollo tells him he has to go to war. Now, this is one thing, and you could say, okay, you need this for courage. I mean, it's not typically how, you know, people would go to war to get, but, but they could still do it today. And, and, but another interesting thing is how, how Apollo tells Hector that he has to go to war. Sometimes it's a god, but sometimes he, he's walking next to him, mm. side by side next to him. Sometimes he's a friend, and sometimes he's a cousin, he's part of his family. Now, if you, there are two ways you can react to this. 
One possibility is you could say, well, this is just fiction. I mean, it's a story and it's a nice story. The other possibility, and this was, I think, Jane's leap, is what if this was the description of people the way people were then? Mm. And you take it seriously. You take this as a almost, now, now you're a psychiatrist and you're you know, reading the report of a patient. You read that and you say, Hector was a, you know, clear schizophrenic. I mean, it's, it's mm. a, a book schizophrenic. It's someone that, you know, when he has to engage into actions, he evokes uh, other, you know, uh, entities that actually are guiding in behavior. These entities appear more in certain moments of stress. They appear in different forms, although they typically manifest themselves with certain regularities and so on. It looks like, so again, there's, there's this idea that, that we could then doing a lot of, of, of mathematics on, on, on trying to understand, the question is, is so, so Jane's idea was, if you read books from all the different traditions and you go back you know, from the very old, the older texts, you know, a bit more than 3,000 years ago, and, and you go down to about 2,000 years ago after the Axial Age where essentially religions and cultures and societies were consolidated more or less the way we know them today. So they transition, a very vast social and cultural transition. If you look at all these, all these traditions, what you will see is that the people in, in, the, in the very first days were described as people that had no volition, like I was just mm. describing Hector. And then you go to other people that actually, Jesus in the Bible, you know, eventually you go, you go from the very Old Testament and then you, I, I'm, I'm an agnostic person, but, yeah. but again, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, what if we take the Bible as if part of it would be a yes. real report of the thoughts of people then? So you can go from Abraham, you know, following the will of mm. God and, and doing... And then, then you see people more introspective, getting more critical about Jesus, their faith. You know, and reflecting and about yes. guilt. Yes. Him who throw the first stone, yes. uh, I mean, this is, a, this is someone directing people to think about their thoughts. I mean, mm. it's, it's a, it's a it's, it's a pedagogy of introspection. So it's something that the father would do today, mm. which is an exercise of our culture, which is think about the reasons why you do things. Mm. And, and, and so has this been, have always fathers and, and mothers, you know, maybe 5,000 years ago told their children to think about the reasons why they did that? Maybe not. Maybe this is quite recent and maybe this has educated Again, not as a biological invention, but as a cultural invention with the same brain we've had for years and years, and maybe for 200,000 years, only very recently, only 3,000 years ago, and maybe not by coincidence in the moment in which there was an explosion of the capacity of expressing thoughts in, in solid text, mm. in, in writings, there was a very deep change in the way we relate consciously to our own environment, our yes. own world. <laughs> it seems very amazing that we started actually speaking about neuroscience, but we ended up in culture. So I guess it must be a privilege in a sense of working in a field that has so uh, has advanced so much that, that there are so uh, important cultural and philosophic implications in the research that is being done by you and other neuroscientists. Yes, yes. I, look... I think this is also a bit of a matter of taste. Neuroscience is very vast, and, and, and many neuroscientists, incredibly brilliant and fabulous neuroscience, spend their lives recording in a single neuron. And actually, I think this has been so far the most productive neuroscience, to be honest. Like, if, if you think at the, at the, yes. uh, the most relevant science actually has come. But I, myself, I like to think about how um, the science that we do relates, because we work about science that actually ultimately it dwells into human behavior, into the human nature. And, and so it relates to history, it relates to education, it relates to politics, you know, why we vote the way we vote, why we ignore, why we are so sensitive to certain manipulations and not to others. Uh, and in my own preference, I think that the conversation was not a coincidence that it went there. This has to do with the fact that, I mean, I, this, ha this happened in my career too. I began doing you know, very basic neuroscience, like much more hardwired uh, biological and physical neuroscience. And more and more I went to you know, the more uh, cognitive aspects, the more the things that are related to behavior, and even more to the things that are related to the human sciences. So I think that, and this is just a description for, for my own taste, I understood, observing my own uh, trajectory, that the questions that motivate me the most are the questions of the human sciences. But that the way that I like to address these questions are more typical of the natural and the exact and the hard sciences. So somehow I've, we've, I and, and some group of, a group of, of people, we found this, this way or this path 
of, of asking these questions about humanity from this more quantitative scientific perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much.